Well, good morning. Should we practice that? Good morning. There's as many outside as there is inside the hall. It's, uh, let me just, I can't get my microphone. My pocket will do. There we are. <laughs> Easy tiger. Right. I just want to share this morning just for a few moments uh, at the end of this service. A little bit on what the kids have been bringing to us about climate and a little bit about the concept of hope and what God really wants to do to us uh, through hope uh, in terms of uh, what the Bible says about that. In 2 Thessalonians verse, uh, chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, Never tire of doing what is good. Never tire of doing what is good. Climate change and agitating is a good thing, is it not? I'll repeat that just in case you didn't quite catch it. Climate change and doing something about the climate is good, is it not? I'm always a bit shocked about Christians. I know all of us do individual things. We recycle and we we try and use less fuel and we, we do all sorts of good things. But as a church, and perhaps I mean this church here, as a church widely, we are largely silent on climate. Our God created some of the most intricate, incredible things in this universe. For example, he created me. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, Tracy said, don't mention yourself. Oh, right, right, right. He created each one of us. Look at the person next to you. No, look at them properly. Look at them. The first thing you'll notice is that they're different from you. So God had to come up with at least five billion different designs. Is that fair? You don't look too impressed by that. When someone asks you to do a drawing, they all begin to look the same after about 10 drawings. God had to invent a 5 billion, 6 billion, 7 billion different U's. That took some time. No, he had time because he invented it. But essentially, he had to have some time to think about that. The uniqueness of that. When you see animals, and obviously Tracy and I very think about a lot about animals, as you know, from our farm. But think about the weird animals. The duck-billed platypus. Was God on a bad day, do you think? I mean, was it, was it just like a laugh? Watch this. I'm going to stick a duck on a weird body and give it like a flipper thing at the end. That'll make them laugh. And they say God's got no sense of humor. When you look at those animal, those natural programs, the David Attenboroughs, you really see the intricacy of God's creation. And yet we, as the human race, are abusing it. We are destroying it. We are making money from it. Thoughtless. 40 acres of rainforest every minute. And yet it washes over us. It's another item on the news. Yet, as a church, as a Christian group, as a community, we need to have a voice. We need to understand that concept of hope. It's not just for us, but it's for many generations. We need to give opposition to the madness of this world that is actually carving out, hollowing out the earth and the creation which God has given us. And I love the chapter that we started with, the first reading. And God gave it to Adam and Eve to look after it. How are we doing? It's a great question, isn't it? How am I doing? Now, I know individually we're all doing lots, but as a church, what are we doing in? So this is today the, the, the tear fund, the wave of hope, or bringing hope. Uh, and it's interesting, the concept we think about hope is almost like unfounded optimism. We hope people will listen. We hope people will change their behaviors. We hope to reduce the increase in the temperature of the earth to one and a half degrees. We hope. I do like that word hope. And just coming away very slightly from climate, in Romans 5 and 1 to 11, it talks about the hope we have in the Lord. In the first few verses of Romans 5, it says this, Therefore, since we've been surrounded by such a great, uh, through faith, we've been peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith in this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of our God. It says the same in Psalm 62. Interesting enough, the word hope there is not like a wave of hope or unfounded optimism on climate. That hope has the root in the word confidence. So let me reread that. We have a confidence in the glory of our God. 
a surety, no fear. I'm not saying we'll be disappointed. The word and the promise of God he gives us, gives us our version of hope, our confidence in our faith, our confidence in our God. Now, let me look at you. How confident do I think you look? Some of you look asleep, frankly. I mean, I'm joking. Some of you don't look perhaps as confident as you should do. I've mentioned before, like any good book reader, I often flick to the last page of a very good novel where I'm very confused how it's going to work out, just almost to reassure myself that it's going to be good. I know that's bad. I have read the last chapter of the best book on the planet. It turns out we win. Now, for some of us, I'm not sure we get up on Monday morning around seven-ish in a winning mode. Does that make sense? Perhaps you're like a good Christian. You jump out of bed, speaking in tongues as your, as your, your I was going to say cassette. Where did that come from? As your, uh, as, your, um, as your waking up mechanism plays the latest song. Are you reading musically for Jesus? You're praying down the stairs for each one of the people in the church, and you leap into your life. Or like me, you crawl around vaguely wondering, why is it Monday? And what happened to Sunday? We have a hope. We have a confidence. And that confidence, that faith, is unlike, as Tracy and the group have brought to us, an unfounded optimism where hope becomes true. But that hope is actually part of what our faith is based on. In John chapter 11, we read the story of Lazarus. Now, the story of Lazarus, and all good kids in good Sunday schools and children's churches will know the story of Lazarus. Let me just remind you for a few moments. Jesus was preaching in Jerusalem. And one of his, some of his closest friends, Mary and Martha, sent a message saying, your friend, your close friend, Lazarus, is mortally sick. Come at once. And Jesus carried on preaching for a couple of more days. And eventually, the news got to him that Lazarus had died. And so he came down into where they were, and the, one of the sisters came to him and said, if only you were here, you could have prevented him dying. And you know the story. Jesus eventually, he stands outside, uh, the, uh, he stands outside the tomb. He has the stone rolled back. It was four days after Lazarus had died. And he rolls it, has the stone rolled back and he says, Lazarus, come forth. An incredible miracle, wasn't it? But in there lays the story of hope. Look at all the negativity that Jesus faced, which I'm sure for some of us, we can feel the same. In verse 8 of John 11, the story of Lazarus, a rabbi said to him, don't go. Oh, well, sorry, he was called, the disciples said, let's go. And the rabbi said, but don't go, rabbi. A short while ago, the Jews of that city tried to stone you, and yet you're willing to go back there. There was fears over Jesus' safety. In verse 17, we read that when Jesus arrived there, he found Lazarus already had been in the tomb for four days. He was faced with the reality, almost the impossibility, of any hope. There's a mistake. Lazarus had been dead for four days, well and truly dead. In fact, they say if you roll the stone back, it'll smell. He was faced with the hopelessness of misunderstanding. Mary came to him and said, if only you'd been here, he might have survived. Martha came to him in verse 32, if only you'd been here. Even the closest people around him were a misunderstanding and piling the hopelessness onto the situation. In verse 37, ever present, some of the Jews said, well, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man keep this man from dying? What a great piece of criticism. Oh, we can do the eye thing. Can't do the death thing. What good is he? What sort of Messiah is this? And Jesus can hear all this. Jesus himself, he says in verse 33, faced by the crowd that were mourning, mourning, he said he was overwhelmed with emotion. He recognized their sadness. And the last hopelessness, I guess, that Jesus faced in verse 38 Deeply moved, he came to the tomb. That's Jesus. It was a cave with a stone load across the entrance. Physically impossible. Fears. Reality. Misunderstanding a friend. Criticism. Overwhelming emotions. 
almost seeming impossible. The signs or the words or the descriptions of no hope, no confidence. Yet what does Jesus do? What would you have done? Let me start with that. Put yourself in the story. You've had all this input, all this helpful input. Remember Job's friends? You must die. <laughs> what a great set of friends Job's had. Anyway, all, this, all this wave of negativity, and he's standing in front. Now, of course, everyone would have gathered, would have gathered around him. But this is interesting. And he's standing in front of the tomb. He asked the stone to be rolled back. Where was Jesus' confidence? Remember, Jesus was man and divine at the same time. And what did Jesus say in verse 43 and 44? He says these words. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He wouldn't have whispered it. Lazarus was dead. He shouted, Lazarus, come out. Why? His confidence or his hope in his father gave him surety of commanding the dead to rise. You don't look too impressed. It's mind-blowing. In my Hollywood version of reading the Bible, because you know me by now, I've got music playing. I've got ticker tapes playing. I've got crowds roaring. As Lazarus walks out, although the funny part of the story in my head is that they asked him to unwrap him. (laughs) That always makes me laugh. Huge miracle. Didn't take off the wrappings, though. Stumbled out like a mummy would, wrapped from head to toe. Can you imagine that? Stumbled out. Couldn't talk because the rappers would have been here. Couldn't say thank you. Jesus' confidence was in that. And what happened as a result of the display of the Christian hope? In verse 45, it says this. There are many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary, in other words, for the funeral, and had seen what Jesus did. They put their faith in him. We, as a church, as individual Christians, should be challenged about our climate, and rightly so. And I'll come back to that in a second. But we are the hope bringers for this world. I'll say it again, because I'm not sure if you recognize your role. You, me, we are the hope bringers for this world. The bringers of Jesus, of God, of confidence in our faith. We need to trust in that hope. This dark, broken world has lost confidence. There is a hopelessness. There is the fear for safety. There's the fear of the impossibility. There's a misunderstanding of friends around us. There is criticism. There is overwhelming emotionally, panic almost, too much to bear. The impossibility of what we face. In all of that, hopelessness. Jesus is not going to come. Because he has sent you. I pray in a moment, and I ask you to respond, we don't have to, I don't suggest that many of you do, but I would pray if you do respond, God is going to give you a cave this week with a stone rolled across and a pile of hopelessness around you. And you're going to pray, and Lazarus is going to come out. Went very quiet there, you notice. Look at that. Yes, Bill, pray for someone else, not me. Because we are the hope bringers to this society. Society has put hope in its political leaders. You can make your own opinion. Society has put its hope in role models, in the economics, in health, equality, social justice, peace, mental health, even climate change, crime, the awful crime of the last few days, even in Lee on Sea. I never thought I'd see Lee on Sea on the BBC News. Of a terribly sad reasons, an upright man of God, a Christian, David Amos, who came to Basildon once and opened the bar and bus uh, the first night it was there, and he was only supposed to be there for a few moments, according to his publicity person, which he said to me, just 15, 10, 15 minutes of David, he's got to go on. When I went there, he was still there four hours later, talking to every single young person. Even that hope of sanctity of life, Is taken away. Yeah, we are the hope bringers. We bring the confidence of God. 
the confidence, the faith. I would encourage you to stand in front of whatever is the hopeless situation you're in, family, in work, situation, society, whatever it is, with confidence. Shout the name of that thing and tell it to come out. Because that's what Jesus did. In our hope, let us give hope. Let us break the cycles of hopelessness that are around us. Doubt not at the heart, at the door of my heart. Hope answered the door. There was no one there. We have never been this way before, as a society, as a world. But I would encourage us to think about the hope that I've shared this morning, to find that hope. For some of you who perhaps even don't have a relationship with Jesus, he is the rock. He, in all this shifting stand, he is the place to put your faith in, your hope in, your confidence in. And if that's you, both here in the room or online, then find someone, talk to them, and commit yourself to that confidence in Jesus. Yes, we want climate change. The young people and the children this morning have eloquently expressed what climate change means and is about. And we should recognise that. It's not an entertainment, although it is entertaining. It is not there just to fill up some time, although it did. It is there to challenge us as a church to stand up and do something about it. And then on top of that, in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 12, it says, As we have such a great hope, let us be bold in the things of Jesus. This world needs your confidence. Your confidence in the things of Jesus. Hopeless, whatever it is, come out. Meet my confidence in Jesus. And let's see it resolved. Let's just pray for a second. If you just want to respond to what I've said, you either face now or want to be in a position to face the stone and the cave, the situation that appears to be homeless. If you want me to pray, just stand to your feet and I'll pray for you that this is a situation. Perhaps you don't face that, but you want to be in a position to face that. Stand to your feet. Let's respond to God's word of hope. That hope is in you to serve a purpose, to bring confidence to this world. The confidence of your faith into those positions and those difficulties of hopelessness. Just stand, but only stand if you really mean it. Because if God answers prayer, and I believe he will, you will face it. You will face it this week. Hopelessness is not for next year, it's for now. Heavenly Father, you see the people that are standing before you. People who want to respond and put into some situation or some circumstances or some family who want to bring the hope and the surety and the confidence of their faith. Lord, make it happen. Lord, make it happen. Lazarus, come out. Amen.